want to say a, a couple of things uh, to begin. First of all, this is International Women's Day. I want us all to remember that. And, and I can't resist an intersectional moment to remind you that everywhere else in the world besides the United States, I think, we remember that International Women's Day was a political event organized by the Socialist Party. So please bear in mind that this is not only about gender, but also about class. Um, the, first, the first International Women's Day, you may not know this, was actually on February 28th, and it was in New York City, and it was organized by the Socialist Party. And in 1910, in Copenhagen, uh, so I thought that was perfectly, particularly appropriate, in Copenhagen, Clara Zetkin, the International Socialist Feminist, um, sort of said we should do this every year, and from 1914 on, it is, was moved to March 8th at the request of the Danes. So, this is, so we are marking uh, International Women's Day for the 101st year on March 8th. Um, so, so important to remember our origins. Second thing, um, the title of this plenary is Where Do We Go From Here? I'm going to be quite literal. When you take the 45th Street exit, you turn left. You go three blocks to Second Avenue, you turn left, go up four blocks, and you're at 48th, 47th Street and Second Avenue, which is Dag Hammarskjöld Plaza, where the demonstration for International Women's Day will take place. So we organized this session and the closing of the conference to be timed perfectly so that you could all get, if you wanted to, to that demonstration as well. So where we go from here is into the streets. It is my great pleasure to turn this last plenary session over to my friend, Dr. as of a week ago, Naomi Wolf. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Kimmel. <laughs> and thank you, everyone. It is, this is the second time in my life I've heard that honorific, and I did, in fact, just defend my thesis after being the oldest graduate student in the world for a very long time. Um, so yeah, this is exciting, but it's, it's, it's even more exciting for me to be here, uh, and what an honor to address this concluding, uh, or just about concluding event, because I've been to a million conferences and panels on feminism and women's issues, and you always wanna feel like you're at the heart of the revolution but I kept waiting and waiting and waiting for one final thing to happen. And under the leadership of so many of you, it is finally happening, which is we have the right people in the room. We have men and women together fighting for gender equality because this is a, a prize and a goal and a victory that belongs to all of us. So thank you for your leadership in, in you know, this, this last kind of insight and most important capping achievement of the feminist revolution, the gender justice revolution. Thank you. Um, so before we begin, uh, we have the honor of having many luminaries here um, at this closing plenary. Uh, we have the Minister for Equality from Denmark, Manu Sareen, who will just open with a statement because he's a minister. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and first of all, uh, thank you very much for being here, uh, saying uh, some words uh, and giving me this uh, opportunity. And uh, also, uh, thank you very much uh, for the great effort and also the engaging uh, for men and boys for gender e equality. And it's very nice uh, seeing uh, good old friends like my, uh, my kind of my, uh, we saw each other in Copenhagen, I think it was uh, two, three months ago, uh, and seeing each other in. Uh, here in New York is uh, great. But talking about uh, gender equality, uh, the last 105 years, uh, we've come uh, far, very far, promo uh, promoting uh, gender equality of uh, women's rights and equal opportunities, uh, but not only uh, for women, but uh, of course also for men. 
And here this year, uh, in 2015, uh, we are celebrating, as you know, uh, the 20-year anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action. And I'm here in New York today, and also the, in, next, in the next week, to ensure the world that Denmark wishes to recommit the, to the targets and the ambitious, uh, ambitions uh, from the 20 years back. Denmark uh, regards uh, the implementation of the Beijing Declaration of, uh, and Platform for, uh, for Action as very, very important instruments to create understanding of gender equality in societies all over the world. Denmark uh, therefore welcomes the global ce celebration of Be Beijing Plus 20. Gender equality for, uh, for years has been uh, considered an, uh, as an issue for women only, and only for women. And please mark the word considered, because it is uh, becoming more and more clear that gender equality must be a common struggle both for men and women. This might be very easy to say uh, on a day like today and in a place like uh, this where I'm among friends and like-minded uh, women and men, people who have spent the last four days discussing, debating, and uh, essentially trying to figure out how we can change the way that many people consider gender equality. But we need to reach out of this room, reach out of our own circles, and work with all kinds of men. And I think that's the biggest challenge. I think that we have, to, uh, we have three good reasons to involve men. First of all, we must, because gender equality benefits both men and women. Secondly, we should, because both men and women should be able to unfold their full potential and participate in the society. And third, we better, because, because it's, it's the smart thing to do. In other words, it's also very, very good business. But looking at the world today, there's still way too, uh, way too much discrimination and violence against women and girls. So there is still a huge need for us men to stand together with women and fight for basic human rights for all, no matter if you were born as a boy or a girl. This being said, it also has become more uh, and more clear that men also need their own platform. As you might be aware of, uh, we, uh, we men have our own issues and our own challenges regarding equal opportunities. Actually, uh, we, have a dual, uh, we have dual roles when it comes to gender equality. First of all, men should still uh, unite with the women's empowerment. Secondly, at the same time, we must, we must also strive to overcome the gender challenges uh, men are facing. We need to regard, uh, regard men, uh, men as uh, partners of change. And with the inclusion of men in the arena, I'm quite hopeful that we can uh, move to the next level of gender equality. Just for a moment, uh, I would uh, like to take you back in time. 100 years ago, Danish women's struggle for equal uh, rights resulted in a major amendment of the Danish constitution. The 1915 uh, constitution gave Danish women the right to vote and stand for election. This in itself was a crucial and a very crucial change which, uh, with a huge impact of the development of the Danish society. But there's, other, uh, there's another point to make of this. As you will imagine, men were uh, the ones sitting on the formal, all the formal power before 1915. So it was the men uh, that could give uh, power to the women. And luckily, there were uh, some progressive men who did that, uh, uh, and they also did the right thing. So all in all, from my point of view, men should let themselves be inspired by these men who 100 years ago took uh, the side of women and joined the struggle for women's rights. But as I also mentioned already, men have their own specific gender issues and ch or challenges, if you may. Many men are fathers and many men are caregivers. And from Denmark, I can see the, uh, that the role of fathers and uh, caregivers are, are changing these years. These men uh, need their own and full rights to be with their children but legal rights are not enough. We also need to change the perception of parenthood and the perception of both mothers and fathers as important parents. 
Also in Denmark, we are still struggling with gender stereotypes when it comes to parenthood. And it is changing. Yeah, I can see that. But it takes time, unfortunately. Health is another obvious example of uh, how men are challenged uh, in, in terms of their gender. Let me briefly uh, give you an example of how we have worked with men, uh, gender, and health in Denmark. A gender mainstreaming project in Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark, showed that, especially in relation to high-risk alcohol behavior, there was a big difference between men and women. We saw uh, particularly low-skilled men in the age of 35 to 65 years it was difficult to reach with the uh, pre preventive solutions. In order to cope with these, uh, the local authorities, the municipalities, changed their outreach work. They would make sure to meet the men where the uh, men already uh, are, in the front of the grocery shop, in the, on the bench, uh, in the res residential area. According to the social workers in Denmark, this focus uh, and this special focus on men as a target group has resulted in a higher quality in their work and more targeted the treatment of uh, uh, approaching the, uh, these vulnerable men. And for me, this is a clear example uh, that uh, this is the way to work if you want to uh, work with men uh, especially. In conclusion, let me once again underline that the gender, uh, gender equality is, is not at all just a women's issue. It's, it must be a global and fundamental principle uh, for all men and women all over the world. Men and women are partners for change, but they do also have their own and separate e equality challenges. But we must allow to choose their, uh, their way to live, their jobs, or their education, their partner, without being guided by prejudice and uh, gender stereotypes, just like women have uh, suffered for many years. This is the only way that we can move forward in order to ensure a true gender e uh, equal society for all. So we must, we should, and we better focus on men and, and gender equality for the sake of men, for the sake of women, and, and for the sake of a sound development of our society. And thank you very much again. And keep on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Minister uh, Serene. And now I'm going to quickly um, ask everybody to introduce themselves and with one sentence share with the audience what you do. A very good afternoon. My name is Abhijit Das. And um, I am, let us say, for the purposes of this meeting, a male activist from the Global South working on gender issues. I'm also a public health professional. I'm Michael Flood. I'm a, <clears throat> I'm a researcher, an educator, and a troublemaker. <laughs> My name is Daphne Watkins. I'm a professor at the University of Michigan, so a men's health researcher. And I'm also the president of the American Men's Studies Association. My name is uh, Maynard Serene, and uh, I'm the minister, of, uh, as you know, uh, for gender equality, but also the minister of social affairs, uh, minister of integration, and the minister of children in Denmark. Good afternoon, I'm Dean Peacock. I'm one of the co-founders at Sonke Gender Justice and the co-chair of the Global Men Engage Alliance. Delighted to be here. And I'm Jackson Katz, uh, educator, uh, writer, filmmaker, and longtime activist in gender violence uh, prevention and gender equality promotion. Thank you, so let's welcome the, the panelists. Thank you so much. What an extraordinary gathering of luminaries in, in different but related fields. I'd like to start with uh, Mr. Das. Um, I understand that you had one uh, global conference in Delhi and now the second one in New York, and our theme today is the intersection of activism and research. So I guess the, the big question to start with for you, you know, what next? What would you like to see next coming out of this? That's a question I've been uh, sort of been looking at, and one of the things that I felt is that I should be preparing my presentation after I have come and after I had an experience of yeah. this meeting. So in the, truthfully, yesterday, after two days of this conference, I've been putting some uh, thought to it first and foremost, let me uh, congratulate Michael, Chris, and the uh, rest of the team for putting to, uh, together this conference. And I think comparisons, comparisons are a bit odious because, you know, um, first of all, uh, 
there were two very, very different um, events. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I must say that for me, this event has been an extremely important and learning event. And I take some very, very important lessons from here. Mm -hmm. The Delhi meeting in many ways was very clearly located within what I call the development paradigm. And uh, though we made a lot of effort to move uh, the conversation from the development paradigm into uh, what uh, one could say the other social justice movement conversations, I see very clearly in this conference, the conference is far more self-reflective in terms of being very much an American experience. It is also a conversation between the activist with the academic. Mm -hmm. So the lesson there I, I see is that, you know, gender and development work is often seen as part of the same continuum. And, and you know, I'm coming from a session which was looking at how do these lessons get into the CSW, how do they get into the post uh, MDG conversation. But gender is not just a issue of poor people. It is not just an issue for the Global South, because most of the UN, when it is talking of social development issues, it's about the Global South. It is for people whose earnings is mostly you know, below the dollar a day or the two dollar a day. Gender percolates society at all levels. And oftentimes, the model or the role setting happens at a class or at an economic group, which is not the target of the development conversation. Over here, I have seen a COO of one of the most powerful global cor corporations make an impassioned statement for gender equality. That is moving gender moving clearly gender. away from the poverty paradigm that most of the development practitioners are talking about. Over here, I have seen teachers from Cape 12 schools, I've seen uh, educators from universities talking about the campus, talking about where Fortune 500, where CEOs are being bred. So it's very, very reflective of the, let us say, the middle class social um, experience and within that middle class social experience locating the issue of gender discrimination, locating the issue of masculinities, locating the issue of men and the way they are brought up as being a problem. This does not happen so much in the global south. The conversation okay. often stays limited within a poverty paradigm and I, I think the lesson I take from here and it's not going to be easy for me to implement that equally mm -hmm. in, in, in the global south because not many people from these worlds engage in the ge uh, gender uh, discussion. So, so, so thank you. I'm just going to rudely jump in um, to, to reflect what I hear you saying, um, if, if, and just in the interest of so much richness to cover um, in such a short time. Um, it sounds like what you're saying is one takeaway is that this work has to not be compartmentalized in terms of development work, in terms of global south, global north, in terms of middle class, upper middle class, uh, lower income that you want to see a holistic set of policies and insights come out of that. Is that, is that correct before we move Absolutely. On? From the Global South, I don't see oftentimes the discussion in the other it. uh, worlds. Okay. It's mostly in the poverty world. It's mostly in the health for the poor. It's the HIV. It's the family planning. It's not so much in, uh, let us say, the uh, conversations in the uh, forum for, uh, let's it. say, uh, lawyers, forum for, uh, um, you know, industrialists. So. I would like that movement to happen. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That's a great insight. Michael Flood, this leads directly to the kind of work that you're doing. Um, again, you know, HIV, uh, sexual assault, um, issues that you're dealing with. Um, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> Michael Flood, let me rephrase that. Um, what would you say is the takeaway that you want to bring to the work that you're doing from this conference? Sure. Look, f for me, um, this conference has been inspiring precisely because of precisely because it involves that collaboration and dialogue um, between activists and academics. And that's a space I'm sort of fascinated by and try to work in. And it seems to me there's two kinds of, I, I want to speak as an academic, uh, and it's not always what I am, um, but speaking as an academic and in particularly to other academics in the room, it seems to me there's two kinds of things that academics can do. We can do research on the issues that activists address, the kind of grievances or inequalities on which activists focus. And there's been great research 
uh, sort of demonstrated at this conference about the workings of gender inequalities and men's roles in those. But I think what's been more of more interest to me is the ways in which academics can do research on how to make social change. So for example, who should we mobilise? Who is it most effective to mobilise? How do we define the problem, specifically for my work on men's violence against women? Is it more effective to make social change, to link men's violence against women to wider gender inequalities, or do we frame it as a single issue somehow? Um, there's been productive research described at this conference on how people come to activism and how their activism is sustained, kind of activist biographies. And finally, there's been research on the strategies that are effective. In other words, what, what um, do activists do that is effective in making social change? What are the political opportunities for, for protest? What are the political um, points of leverage? So I think there are all sorts of ways in which research um, can contribute to social change, as well as, of course, being itself a site of social change. Two final things. One is that, I mean, we probably take for granted that scholarship is good for activism, that research is good for activism. And I very much have the sense that if activists, you know, I count myself among those, if, if we activists and social movement advocates don't reflect, don't draw on theory, then we will very much be the prisoners of our own mm. conditions. We will be prisoners of contemporary social circumstances. Can you give an example of that? Um, I think if we don't think about how we make social change, I and mean, I think about the work I used to do as an educator in schools, that I'd go into that work somehow thinking, it was kind of magic thinking, that talking at or even involving these young people in discussion would somehow make social change without a sense of, well, why would it do that? How would it do that? What, you know, what mechanisms am I assuming are at play there? And I think writ large, that's a problem for activism. But the final point I wanted to make is that what I've increasingly realised over the last two days is that activism is good for scholarship. And, uh, and the, the, there's, there's a few ways in which that's true. One is that uh, getting your hands dirty, if you like, as an activist makes us much more aware of power, of the power of the state, the power of collective forces to both entrench patriarchal masculinity or indeed to shift patriarchal masculinities. Activ getting involved in activism also makes us w more aware of our own social locations and the need to reflect critically on our own social locations. It gives us experience of uh, individual and collective agency and I think perhaps most, most importantly of all, it highlights the fact that kind of patriarchal masculinities, the structures of gender are not fixed in stone. There are tensions and cracks, and I think activists know full well what those tensions and cracks are. So scholarship is good for activism, but activism is good for scholarship. Okay, I think, thank you. Like, that's great, it's a great, it's a great statement. I think I see, you know, I think I see themes coalescing from the end of this conference. I think, uh, you know, this was your intention, Michael, to see where these conversations would lead in this direction and what productive partnerships and insights would come. Daphne Watkins, this goes, it leads again straight to you. Um, you have been doing research uh, on activism, right? And the question is how does activism change, the, how does what you've seen of activism change the research questions that you're asking? So I'm representing the American Men's Studies Association and the, the goal of AMSA is to do the critical study. So we focus on the critical study of men and masculinities. And so one of the things that I take away from this conference is um, all of the accomplishments of you all, that we've done so much, but there's still so much that needs to be done. And I think coming from an organization that focuses primarily on research, teaching, and clinical practice, I immediately go to the methods and making sure that we have rigor with, with uh, the rigor that we use to actually study men and masculinities. And so one of the things that I hope comes out of this conference is, is more conversations about making sure that we are approaching the study of masculinities with rigor. Mm -hmm. Because I think one of the things I've enjoyed while I've been here is to go to the poster sessions, to talk with you all during your panels and your, your oral presentations about the methods that you're using, making sure that we add a credibility and a validity and a reliability what we're studying about men and masculinities. It's one thing to say that you do research, but it's another thing to say that you do research with rigorous methods so that we can take activism and policy to the next level. And so I'm really looking forward to the exchange that's going to happen beyond this conference, making sure that the reciprocity of our scholarly exchange continues beyond today. Right, this is, I mean, as, a, as a, a lay person, I mean, someone who's not in this field, when you talk about studying masculinity as a thing, that in itself is so revolutionary because, you know, masculinity used to be like the air. You can't study it, it's everywhere, it's not a thing that you can scrutinize. It's not constructed, it's not, 
you know, evaluable. Um, and so it's it, the more, for, for lay people like me, the more data you generate showing that you can study how men behave, and that's the thing. It, it weirdly equalizes discourse because women have been under the microscope for so long. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm trying to say something that not that eloquently, but you get it. It's, it's I, I welcome my fellow specimens under the microscope. <laughs> Um, so moving to, I'm going to skip over to Jackson Katz because you are right at the, I wouldn't even say the intersection of, of research and activism, you're right hands on activism, changing men, changing men's lives, uh, changing men, how men relate to their peers around sexual violence and domestic violence. Um, what do you see, you know, as your ideal thing um, happening next? And you can, you know, wish list, policy, personal change, insight, cultural insight, what's your favorite thing that you can imagine coming out of this conference? I like, thank you, Naomi, that, I like that question. Um, we need to get into rooms of power and hold men who are in powerful positions accountable for addressing these issues on a systematic and institutional level across the board, across the world. And so often the discussion, for example, to give a specific example, so often this discussion, for example, in the US military is about the young troops. The young troops need training. They come from dif difficult backgrounds. Meanwhile, there's very little training for the officers, for the, for the senior uh, leaders in the government, as well as in the, in the DOD. And they make decisions on a daily basis that affect hundreds of thousands of people's lives. And yet, so little training, so little accountability. And that's true in lots of other systems, like in the university system. I work in colleges and universities extensively, mostly in North America. Um, but overseas as well. And again, administrators know so little. They tend to know so little about these subjects. And the, the people who know so much about the subjects of sexual violence and domestic violence and relationship abuse tend to be women at a much lower level of institutional authority and, and power. And yet these women don't have the power to enact their knowledge, but the, but the administrators who have the power don't have the knowledge and they're not ever or rarely held accountable. And I think we're, we're at a moment in historical terms in the states, and I can't speak for other countries. I know that this is a United States piece, but because of scandals in, um, in, in, in college and university settings where sexual assault cases have been badly handled, there's survivors who are you know, suing the, the, the uh, institutions because of the federal government, United States government's coercive power to pressure colleges and universities to enact policies. So it's a moment now that people, and including administrators, are taking seriously the idea that we have to address sexual violence and domestic violence in a preventive sense. Um, but one, one, of my ch one of the challenges, and I think this relates to the, the goals of, of this conference in various ways, one of the challenges is um, some of the ways that, that the policies and certainly the prevention piece is being enacted on college and university campuses is depoliticized, eviscerated of its social justice foundation. And I made a comment at a, at a Berkeley conference just last, two weeks ago, a big sexual assault conference at UC Berkeley, and it was like 500 people in the room, all this energy, mostly it was women. I'm sorry, there was only 50 men or so out of 500 people. That's not a good thing. It should have been a lot more men. But anyways, the point I made is I'm coming to this conference in New York in a couple weeks where all these scholars and activists from all over the world who are on the cutting edge of thinking critically about masculinities and violence and gender equality and all kinds of such, Where's the connection between what's happening on college campuses, which is de depoliticized, they're not talking about masculinities, they're talking about, you know, really depoliticized bystander intervention kind of strategies. And, and, and I think we need to marry the, sort of the, the knowledge and the political sensibility in this room to the, to the institutional practices that are emerging around the world, and including my country. It's really well put. Just before I go on, I just want to see a show of hands. That description that Jackson gave of like, um, you know, primarily women, but lower, level people in an organization with the knowledge about sexual assault and violence and the decision makers at the top not communicating. Does that reflect, has anyone else had an experience like that, seen that? Is that a common pattern? Very, very interesting. So one of the things I'm interested in is, because I'm interested in policy to create social change, is it seems like here's a takeaway that you know policies that bring those uh, stakeholders together and transmit the knowledge from these silos to the decision makers and hold them accountable, as you say, that's a really productive outcome. Um, and let's go to Dean Peacock. Um, you also work, I mean, we all, you all work in sort of the 
cutting edge, advanced guard, but you're also in a very hands-on activist way, you know, speak about what you'd like to see. Sure, and I'm gonna connect with Jackson's comments because I think it's critically important that we get in those rooms where there is power, but I don't think that's enough. Um, we're gonna, some of us are gonna spend some time next week at the CSW in rooms where there's a lot of power um, and there's a whole lot of policy posturing in those rooms. Commitments made that no one intends to follow up on. Yeah. So I think, you know, and that's important. We need the normative framework, we need the leverage to be able to say you committed to this and we expect you to do something. But I think what we've learned from activists in South Africa, particularly AIDS activists, who were very successful in enacting the kinds of critical policies that we needed to make sure that we have arrived at the situation we have in South Africa where three million people access antiretroviral treatment every day, up from 30,000 10 years ago. What we need is to really, I think, learn about some of those strategies, and that of course connects with Michael's comments. Um, the work that was done to mobilize local community knowledge, community activism, to embed deeply in local communities a sense of rights literacy, that people understood their rights as they're articulated in the Constitution and national and local laws, and were able then to demand those um, laws and policies, constitutional obligations be implemented. So I think, you know, my friendly amendment to Jackson's is we need to be in the room and we need to be out in the streets. Yeah. Yeah. We need to be demanding that this fantastic normative framework that has been developed over the last 20 or 30 years actually gets implemented. In South Africa, as I'm sure you know, we have some of the best laws in the world on domestic violence and sexual violence. That reflects hard-won victories by women's rights activists in South Africa. Um, unfortunately, we do not have the kinds of oversight mechanisms um, that we have in the world of AIDS activism. So when it comes to AIDS activism, we have a very richly formulated set of oversight mechanisms that allow activists and civil society members to make real demands on the state that they in fact implement the lofty commitments that are put in laws and that are issued from bodies like the one down the street. So I think, you know, the intersectional focus in Delhi, this real connection with other social justice movements, slum dwellers associations, people working on sanitation, people who are really thoughtful and experienced with social justice activism that grounds our power in local communities, I think is vital. Um, and I think that's the important next generation of work that those of us doing work with men and boys really need to think about. How do we make sure that our work is deeply connected to women's social justice activists and movements that can help us understand how we do this critical rights literacy work, this critical oversight and accountability work. Fantastic. Um, so again, to restate, as I see sort of pictures of an ideal framework emerging from everything that you all are saying, uh, in addition to the deal makers in the room, and this reminds me a lot of a movie I saw, a documentary about um, AIDS activism in the 80s in the United States, the, the deal makers in the inside um, with the the health organizations and the government, and massive grassroots pressure in this pincher movement, and if you study social justice movements, that's a really winning combination. So like one recommendation, if I'm tweeting about this conference to all of my you know, non-specialist friends who care about this issue, how can we help you? Like what would you say to people outside this room about how we can help create that oversight, create that pressure to help you inside the room? What, like one example. Yeah, it is. And the question is, how can we, how can we build that? How, how can we be leveraged for you, non-specialists, yeah. ordinary people in the street? I mean, I think, you know, in very simple ways, to be active in local communities, to make these issues real in your neighborhood, in the places where you congregate and move. Right. Um, so I think that's what we are trying to build in South Africa, is a sense that wherever people are, these are issues that they're concerned about. Okay. At the school level, people are insisting that their local school governing body has right. real policies on these issues. The same in the workplace. And, the and actually, in, in this country, people actually, one of the last places citizen activism is open is on the school council level. Um, so that's, that's an access point and a pressure point. And it sounds like you're saying, so it sounds like you're sort of dovetailing with what you're saying, which is make it holistic, right? Wherever you are, see where gender justice can be brought in to that discussion and that pressure point. Now I'm gonna go to you because you're inside those rooms, making those decisions. Um, 
So hopefully we have new ways to pressure you and people like you. Um, but it, you know, Denmark is so way ahead on so many of these issues, we don't have to pressure you guys very far. Um, but I do have a question, which is, um, can you give us concrete examples of Danish initiatives regarding the promotion of gender equality for men? Is that what we want to say, how we want to say it? Regarding the promotion of gender equality for men? Okay. It would be nice if they were just equal. <laughs> yeah. That was a joke. <laughs> uh, but Sorry. first of all, uh, I would like to make a comment about um, the distance be between co policy makers and, uh, you said, uh, lower level people. I don't like that word. Uh, maybe I, if I want to uh, translate the Danish word, it'll be grassroots or something like that. Um, and it's, uh, for me, it's uh, quite surprising that uh, it's like that. Um, for example, um, the next uh, week, um, we will meet <coughs> in uh, the Danish delegation. It's uh, uh, policymakers, it's grassroots, people knowing things about uh, gender equality. And actually, we meet every morning before going to CSW. And uh, it makes me think, how, how come it is like that in Denmark? And I think uh, maybe uh, many of uh, the policymakers, um, member, member of parliaments, uh, ministers, Actually, our former uh, grassroots, uh, I've been a, a social worker for 20 years of, uh, in my life, so it's, it's much easier getting into pol politics in Denmark, I think, than it is in other countries. Yeah. So that's, it's that's why it's, uh, that's, uh, so, uh, that, uh, there's this uh, very um, close uh, connection mm -hmm. between uh, po the policymakers and the grassroots. Mm -hmm. And uh, regarding um, what, what we do in Denmark, uh, First of all, uh, we think it's very uh, important to uh, having uh, a awareness about these issues, especially uh, uh, gender equality and men and boys. That's what we are talking about right now. Uh, for an example, uh, in, in the kindergartens, we don't see any men. So we are trying to promote more, more men uh, in kindergartens, not only in school, because we, we, we think that if you want to change the attitudes of boys, you have to do it when they're very small. And you have to show them that not only women are caregivers, but all, uh, uh, men also can do it. Uh, we have to show the girls. We also have to show the boys that we could, uh, we could do like that. And uh, so that's the way, uh, I think, uh, to, uh, to find some, some solutions that it's uh, working and starting very, very early yeah. uh, if you want to make a mind change. It's a great example. Um it's a, a very concrete example, and as we leave here, I'm, I'm sure all of us have new ideas for policy dreams and, and new techniques and tools for policy outcomes. When you work in, say, sexual violence, so I, I worked in a, a rape survivor's community, and you get quite depressed about men, <laughs> and um, you get, it's very common to have like an existential crisis, like what's wrong with them, like no disrespect. Um, I, these are jokes, I'm sorry I'm joking. And I guess what I'd like to ask each of you very briefly is tell me, so that I can tell all of my friends and everyone who cares about these issues, everyone who's raising boys uh, and, and wants to raise them, you know, conscientious, caring, ethical men in a really, you know, sexist, violent culture, how is the work you're doing, why should we believe men as a whole can change and stop, like the question I asked you at lunch, why do men rape? Like, I wanna, I wanna believe that there, you know, there's change. So what, what evidence do we have? What, 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 should I, what should I tell people that you guys have created that we can be hopeful about? Thank you, I, I mean, we have all these legacies in the world of struggles for social justice where a new normal is created by people coming together and organizing and taking risks and being leaders, and the world changes. And I think some of the world has changed. The, 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 the multicultural, you know, global women's movements have been utterly transformative on a world historical scale. There's a small percentage of men, but a growing percentage of men who are joining with them, who are making connections between all the other social justice issues. You want to talk about militarism and not talk about masculinities? You want to talk about, you know, poverty and not talk about masculinity, the rugged individualist ideology that underpins so much of the callousness towards the poor is a gendered ideology. I mean, all of these stuff is, all this stuff is connected and intersecting, and there's a growing movement of men in this room and around the world working in collaboration with women in the global south and the global north who are making these connections, and 
this is a moment of possibility, and I think we, we are in a transformative time, and if we, ha if we have, you know, you have to keep optimistic. I, I'll, I'll stop with this. There's a quote that I use. Some of the other people may have, might have heard this quote from Antonio Gramsci. He says, um, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Oh, nice. And we have to be optimistic in a certain sense to get out there and do the work that we do, but sometimes it's easy to be pessimistic in the face of this, this stag, you know, the huge, giant challenges ahead of us. But every person in, in the history who's engaged with transformative social change has dealt with enormous odds against them, but they persisted in the face of it. Wonderful answer. Thank you. I knew I would hear great, inspiring things. Please go ahead. What would you say? You know, I, I think it's clear that men and women change. Um, I think we know it anecdotally, no, we know it from our own families. If I think about my grandfather and my father, um, my nieces and nephews, the roles are enormously different for them. So we know change happens. I think for us a big question is how do we accelerate that change? How do we support that change? Right. I'll tell you a quick story. We, as a core part of our strategy in Sonke, we have what we call community action teams. We have about 80 across the country um, filled by a few thousand community members. We received a call from a deep rural part of South Africa, um, a part where gender norms are quite conservative. A man who had been to one of our workshops who called us to tell us that um, in his work, he's a taxi driver, he drives a pickup truck um, in and out of rural communities into the, the local towns. Um, one day, standing at the taxi rank, a man pulled a woman out of, not his taxi, but another one, and stabbed her to death. She had picked up her protection order that morning um, and you know, the terrible tragedy was it was December 10th, International Human Rights Day. Um, Sandiswa died. Um, he called us because he'd been to a workshop and um, he wanted our support. Um, nine months later, in a way that is unprecedented in South Africa, um, despite tremendous initial disregard from the police, um, we had 450 community members out on the streets of Butterworth, small rural community in the Eastern Cape, demanding justice for Sandiswa and demanding that Klabadia, the man who had committed the crime, be um, handed down a meaningful sentence. Um, it was utterly unprecedented in South Africa. Court cases can go on for years and years, dozens of hearings before there's any resolution. 17-year sentence was handed down. Um, and alongside that process, that man and then a whole flurry of new community action teams that were established in those communities, again filled by men and women, um, surfaced a whole range of other cases like that and are now demanding justice. Their victory in that case emboldened them. Um, they are now, in ways that I think we would expect in social justice movements, making other kinds of demands on local government. Men and women together, um, we managed to get the king of the Hossa nation to come out, declare his support for the work with men and boys for gender equality. Wow. That's reasonably unprecedented, and I think um, you know, a very inspiring example, but also a relatively ordinary example. I think these kinds of social justice victories won by men and women together are happening across the world. Thank so. you so much. Thank you for that beautiful, beautiful anecdote. Very inspiring. Very <clears throat> we still have a lot of challenges uh, all over the world, but um, I'm, I'm not a pessimist like you. <laughs> um, and if you look at Denmark, uh, and that's uh, where I have my experiences from, uh, for example, if you look at uh, violence uh, against women, uh, the numbers are declining a lot. They're declining? Yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, for the, I think, the, uh, the last 10 years, I'm just looking at Kia, we went from 42,000 women every year to now to some 20,000. How much? 29,000. That's a very big change. Congratulations. And, Thank you. And, and the interesting, the inter interesting uh, thing is, why is that happening? And it's happening because we are breaking the, down the taboo. We, it's happening because uh, um, men and women, uh, it's a, a struggle for both of us. Yeah. And it's a uh, white ribbon is actually, uh, stand up, Kia. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's a part of the solution. And the other part of, part of the solution is that as parents, we are telling our kids, boys and girls, that this is not acceptable at all. Thank We're having sports stars in the football field, you know, going out saying we are giving uh, the the violence the red card. And if you work like that, it can happen, Fantastic. and that's the way to and do you're it. Seeing change, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. 
So I'm not certain if I remember the question, but this feels like the final word. So I'm going to yeah. make my final word if that's okay. I'm feeling like this is the wrap up. So having had several conversations with many of the budding scholars and activists and teachers and clinicians in this room, I, I feel like I should state the obvious and say, you know, I'm the only woman up here on the, the panel and I'm the- I did notice that. And I, and I happen to be the president of the American Men's Studies Association. And I think that as a woman who genuinely cares about the living and working conditions of men, you know, certainly women as well, but definitely men, I just want to encourage those of you who are still trying to find your way and just be authentically you. And don't worry about the criticisms and the questions because there are amazing women out there fighting for women, but we also need amazing women out there fighting for men as well. And so continue to do all the work that you do, find fantastic models of collaborations. It's very easy for us to sit up here and say, activists, researchers, clinicians, teachers, you should all get together and collaborate. But find amazing models mm. for how to truly operationalize those collaborations. Mm. Yeah. And mentor the next generation. I don't care how old, how young you are, Everybody needs mentees and everybody mm. needs mentors. Yeah. So continue to do what you do, continue to fight because the living, working, and successful evolution of society depends on it. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Um, my heart's pounding a little because of what I'm about to say, which is that. I think it's understandable that you and other, other you know, women and men become depressed about men, and I've certainly felt depressed and hopeless about men and the bad things that some men do. And in fact, I think women need to become angrier at men, hmm. actually, to, really? to be more angry at the injustices <laughs> that, that, that men perpetuate. And I, you know, I suppose I want to I wanna say that we cannot take for granted that either masculinity is scholarship or masculinity's activism will be feminist in its frameworks or its agendas. And in fact... That's a really interesting statement. And in, in policy and programming around the world and in scholarship too, there are anti-feminist pushes and trends and work with men is sometimes done for non or anti-feminist reasons and the same in scholarship. So we cannot take for granted um, a kind of feminist agenda. Um, so I suppose I want to urge you know, I, I don't know what to call it, but something like hope and anger and a passionate love for social justice. Wow, love that, love that. And I love it, I love it. This is totally inspiring. Just to, just to clarify, I'm not depressed about men, I'm depressed about the statistics. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I want to sort of bring back the question you had about rape and of course um, in Delhi, as many of you may know, there was a ghastly rape a couple of years yes. ago and uh, in many ways that sort of focused our attention on the issue of rape and the issue of the men. Uh, one thing has been happening in India and earlier a lot of rape happened through men who assumed impunity. Hmm. Men who came from positions of powers, sons and nephews of politicians. Hmm. But here in the Delhi case and there was a Bombay case and there was another Delhi case we find the poorest of the poor. Now, and I'm, and I'm saying that poorest of the poor with a sort of dramatic pause, it's a completely different kind of man who is now being implicated, a 17-year-old pavement dweller, completely uh, sort of poor destitute, doing an act of savagery, of expression of power. Now, when I say this, it is very easy to say such men should be hanged. And in India, this was a very strong call that such men should be hanged. But I think from the, activ uh, from the activist perspective, that does not give us any solution. We have to look towards, and here I call upon the sociologists, the academics, to understand that there is something happening where men are being affected by the globalization, the industrialization, the military industrial complex that is being promoted all across the world. And this is creating some kind of complete, uh, what should I say, messed up young men. Hmm. Now these messed up young men who are suffering from the development model that we have, you know, and, and, and I'm sitting in the US so I, I don't mind saying that, it's being exported very actively from here, is messing up our poor men. Now I'm not justifying that act of that man.
But what I'm trying to say is that hang that man is, cannot be a sufficient solution. We have to get into structural solutions, structural analysis of what is happening to men in the global south. So that's one part of my story. So it's not so easy. The second part of the story, which is coming I from I should our say work, very briefly. So yeah, and this is the work with men and cannot only be a social justice struggle out in the streets. It has to be a social justice struggle out in the streets. But at the same time, each man should be given the opportunity to actually cherish relationships with women. Relationships with women, with mother, with sister, in, with daughter. And what we have found is actually the gender transformation that we all call for is happening when you work with men, let us say, on HIV and on health, the consciousness changes and that person is actually now talking and looking at men's, women's participation in the political space. That is the transformation. When you can start connecting the dots of gender discrimination in your head, and we have found that happens very strongly when men get invested in relationships with women in their lives. Wonderful. So, so uh, we're so fortunate. I mean, really, I do feel like this is ground zero in a positive way of a, a real revolution, a global revolution, one that I personally have been waiting for my whole adult life. So I want to personally thank every one of you for re-inspiring you know, me and everyone I'm going to be telling uh, about this conference to and all of your leadership. I want to have another round of applause for these incredible leading lights, shining lights, pioneers, and for all of you as well. Thank you so much, and thank you, Mike. Thank you so much. Um, one of the reasons that I, I hope you're as frustrated and excited and energized as I am, because this was so rich and generative of these conversations that I want us to be walking out with. So if you feel complacent now, it's all is lost. Um, and I want to say something about that. First, I want to say to my, my students in the room and the uh, other graduate students, researchers, this category messed upness. This is not a c categorical conversation, yes or no. This is a continuum. We could actually create a variable. Um, so I want, I, I, I want to say, I want to use this opportunity, since I have not actually made a formal presentation at this conference, to say one word in response to some of the things that I just heard um, from this uh, really inspiring uh, conversation. And I want to say something about the way that I feel the conversation has just ended. And I, and I credit uh, uh, Naomi with, with some of this. And that is the kind of optimism that I have sensed. I have been so inspired by some of the conversations, personal conversations, the, some of the plenary conversations, the experience that we had at the dinner last night listening to, to Jane or Hurry. Uh, and, and the thing is, I, I want to say, both as an activist and as an academic, I think the posture has to be one of optimism. If you are an activist, you must believe change is possible. That is an optimistic position. If you are an academic, you must believe, I believe that if I can inspire my students to engage critically with their world, their lives will be better for it. That is an optimistic posture. And one of the people I have learned this from is Naomi Wolf. She won't remember this. I was, a, I was a, a setting, sitting in an audience when she gave a talk at Stanford 15 years ago, maybe, maybe, maybe even 15 years ago, and I remember the conversation was the depressing one. Oh my God, the litany of problems and, you know, there's so far to go and, and everything, and everybody knows them, everybody knows those in the room, and they're all right. And Naomi just paused for a second and she said, you know, let's not forget where we are. There are women alive today in the United States who could not vote, could not serve on a jury, could not drive a car. And she went through this long list and I said, this is the position that we always have to be in. Always looking backward to see how far we've come, but not get complacent or self-congratulatory about it because we also know how far we have to go. And so what I want to leave you with is what I believe is a contradictory temperament for this marriage of academia and activism. So I want to thank you for that, because it really inspired me to, to think both be, you know, where we've come from and where we need to go. And it's about our temperament. And it's, it, it is a, this marriage seems to me to rest on two seemingly contradictory uh, personality traits. On the one hand, 
We know that the work that we are doing is so urgent and we must have a sense of urgency about it. The issues that we face, the problems that we face are so powerful, so dramatic and so pressing immediately, lives are at stake. And at the same time as we acknowledge this urgency, we have to be patient. We have to know, as one of my heroes, Max Weber, once says that politics is the boring of hard boards. It is long, it takes a long time, we will not live to see the end of this story, but we know we will have contributed to it. Thank you all. This has been a very inspiring conference.